guess we can get started. Um, I have a lot of material to prepare. I just want to cover all areas here. Um, first of all, I'd like to you know, say welcome and thank for joining me. My name is Kosti Lab, working at a, as an engineer at SpringSource. And uh, this is a presentation of what it takes to build big data pipelines. Um, you notice there probably in the title, at least in my presentation, that there is no specific mentioning of Spring because um, Spring is basically just a component. And my aim for this talk is not just to focus on the Spring side, but sort of what it takes to build a whole pipeline. And this is not just about Spring. Um, so we'll look a bit of what big data is. Um, unfortunately, nowadays it seems to be sort of a hype term, so I'd like to get you know, to the actual things be beyond this hype. Look at what are the platforms or tools out there to work with uh, big data and how Spring can manage, can help you with managing and building and creating that pipeline. Uh, you know, in layman terms, I guess, if you've attended uh, the keynote yesterday where Mark, Mark Pollack showed that demo with uh, Twitter, where you had uh, Justin Bieber versus uh, Obama versus Mitt Romney, well, uh, this is a uh, session of what, you know, what's going on behind that demo, what's the architecture behind it. Unfortunately, well, Mark took the, uh, the thunder by doing the demo, so I'm left with the, all the gory details behind it. So, what is big data? Well, um, this is a Wikipedia, right, the ultimate resource in knowledge, and, uh, well, you can read it right there. It's a collection of data sets so large and complex that, is, that it becomes difficult to process it using on-hand database tools. As you can see, it's a big, quote, right, this is big data, and everything about it is big. In other words, when you're looking at big data, it's not necessarily something different, you're still talking about data, each other, the volumes of data is, uh, is quite large, and mainly that is because you're looking at any type of data to collect. You don't, you're not just looking at one uh, type, one structure, one sort of data source, but rather the whole anything that can produce data that potentially might be useful for you in the future. So it's not even something that you're looking for right now, but something that potentially might be interesting at some point. So to understand why big data is now becoming sort of a, an interesting topic, it's useful to take a look at the, some of the data trends that have occurred in the last year. This is just a, uh, a I guess uh, you can call it a graph from 2009, so it's fairly old, and it says that Every year, we have 60% more data added on top of the existing data. So as you can see there, or the horizontal, uh, this is, it just scales until 2008. We're right in 2012. And well, you know, you can see various uh, sources or various types, like camera phone, digital TV, audio. But what I find interesting about this slide is that blue line there at the bottom, that's legacy data. It means data that's already around that it's already in your data center. And the green stuff on top is the data that gets added every year on top of that legacy data. And just to put uh, things into perspective, to put some numbers into it, uh, right, we're already um, storing zettabytes of information and by 2030 we'll have one yottabyte. So one yottabyte is basically a terabyte of terabytes. It's, you know, 10 power of 24. So we're talking about a lot of data. Now, obviously, not everybody is going to store all that data. Right? Not everybody is going to store digital TV, digital photos, but obviously we're in a world where we have more devices and our digital footprint keeps increasing right? over and over again. So this is not you know, just a hype. This is just something that we have to deal with. Another interesting aspect of big data in general, sort of, okay, I have a lot of data. What do I do with it? Well, um, there are very or interesting stories out there, but one... Um, that's nice is that nowadays apparently movie producers or magazines are trying to uh, forecast how well a movie is going to be received by, based by the sentiment out there. So anything from social networks to emails to reviews, what the actors are doing, right? They're trying to forecast that, the success of a movie before the movie actually appears. So this is about data or information, if you want, that previously was just discarded. You know, now it's stored. And it's about trying to find different connections, trying to find some sense of all that data. There's also an interesting trend. You know, this is not really something new. Um, the trend is basically that every two years, the um, 
number of transistors uh, inside a CPU doubles or the power, that's sort of the Moore's law. But I guess if you look at it from outside as a big picture, it means that the hardware becomes more and more powerful, which means the, the cost for that hardware basically you know, is halved every 18 months, so one year and a half more or less. So we're talking here not necessarily just about CPU power, but also storage. Uh, and an interesting side effect of that is because we're talking about commodity hardware, also the software is starting to improve. So um, things like you know, distributed databases, distributed infrastructure, that becomes just something that software know, uh, software can adapt and can use. So all these you know, trends point towards a problem that is going to be long lasting, or at least a challenge. So what is a big data pipeline? Well, this is an architecture with plenty of moving slides and arrows. It's not, really, if you look at it, it's not something new. It just shows sort of you know, the various steps, um, I guess, in a fine-grained uh, way of what it takes to deal with, uh, with big data. So uh, there are the, I guess you could start at the um, left-hand um, side from the top, where you have various sources. Uh, for those that attended the keynote, right, this would be Twitter. But it doesn't have to be just social, uh, social network. It can be anything that's relevant to you. So you can think of emails, database. Uh, how well is your network doing? Do you have any spikes? How well is the CPU? Do you have any cache miss? Uh, are there any files going, on, going around your network? Do you have certain activity inside your website? Right? Any type of information that you produce inside your company, inside your network, can be recorded. And obviously, this means you're not just talking to one data source, but actually multiple data sources. And for the most part, again, you might not even do something to that information right away. You're just storing it because at some point later on, you might find it interesting. You might find some connections, right? So first and foremost is about storing the data and then potentially analyzing it. Now, if the data flows in or comes in to your store, you can do some processing, on-the-fly processing. This doesn't necessarily have to be something complex. You can do things, basic things like uh, aggregating the logs, right, or uh, just um, applying some zips so they uh, take less space. Or you can do something more interesting. Uh, we've seen this emergence of what is called the real-time processing, where as the data flows in, basically you have this window of data and you're just analyzing it as the data flows in. So again, you can increment counters or potentially you can try to find some relationship between all these different nodes that produce data. Once the data right, is in some sort of shape, it hits your actual store. This is what it's, uh, the box right there at the bottom, the unstructured data store. I'll talk about what HDFS actually is uh, in just a second. So the idea here is that right, you, you have a lot of data that you have to store. Now, because it's a lot of data, you, don't wanna, you cannot even store it in one machine. You need multiple machines for that. And because you're storing on multiple machines, obviously, it's not just about dividing the data, but also handling the case where one of these machines dies or you know, the network going down. So there is a lot of infrastructure there that needs to be provided in order for you to have access to the store where you save the information. Now, once the information is saved, obviously, you have various ways of looking at it. Right? If you're not using the data, you're just taking up space, you're wasting space. So you can use Hadoop again or any other batch processing to literally look at the data. But batch processing means you're having a huge uh, data size. Obviously, it takes a long time to go to, to process all that data. So typically what uh, most architectures do is they create some sort of indexes, such as every midnight I'm crunching through the data, I'm finding something relevant, and then I'm storing that, you know, that small working set, that cache if you want somewhere so then I can very easily access it. Um, you have things like HBase or Gemfire where you can put it on Redis even as Mark showed in the keynote. Right? I'm, I'm doing the aggregation and then I'm storing data there so I can create a lot faster than it would take with Hadoop or any type of batch processing or I can have some sort of SQL like facades in, in front of it such as Greenplum or Astro Data. There are other products out there as well. So what happens when you have the data where you push it out? Right? You, you, you can either perform more sort of analytics, but typically you just uh, show it out. Right? You, you create the results uh, that you wanted from it. So the interesting thing here is, um, if you're looking back at this slide, right, really 
is still about data, it's still about CRUD. You create, read data, right, store it, update and delete it. The workflow is the same, maybe not the delete part, let's say. Uh, there you can have an archive action. But other than that, it's still the same thing, right? It's just that because you're talking about a different scale, you're talking about different sources, so now you have to pay more attention to the individual components out there. You cannot just use the same solution over and over again. So you end up with different scalable systems that do an individual task very well, which means you have different entities, which means you end up with some sort of integration problem. First of all, what's the, the data format that you're trying to, to save? Where do you get that? How do you process that? How do you analyze it, right? There are different things that now you have to take into consideration because, well, the data is just different. So you end up with some sort of workflow. Uh, from the architecture point of view, it's the same, but actually when you look at the details, you typically have this, as I mentioned, seven steps. And depending on the technology or the data that you're choosing, like Hive or Pig or the various tools, you end up with slightly different implementation details. Um, again, this is something that most of you that have worked with integration have already encountered. Right? It's the same workflow, more or less, with different uh, suspects. And what's interesting, though, about big data is you cannot just uh, typically assume you have a certain workflow. It's not just event-based or it's not just batch-based. Typically, it contains both ends of the spectrum. So you end up with a bit of everything. Um, for those that are interested more in sort of the uh, research behind this uh, problem, there is this interesting paper by Mr. Michael Stonebreaker. This is sort of a granddaddy of uh, databases. He used to work on Sybase. Postgres uh, now has a product called VolDB. has this very seminal paper called One Size Fits All an Idea, Whose Time Has Come and Passed, where he goes at length at this type of problems. So again, conceptually, we're talking about the same thing in practice. Well, it's not exactly the same thing. So my statement, or I guess the, the takeaway of this presentation, is to say that, well, if you're trying to approach big data, if you want to do big data pipelines, you can find that Spring projects can be very helpful and provide a nice foundation for this type of problem. So OK, you know what big data is. You're interested in you know, using and creating one sort of big data pipeline. What does it take? So the platform, the de facto platform for this is Hadoop. I guess most of you here have heard about it. That's why you're here. And Hadoop well gives you these two things there at the bottom, those two blue layers. So the first one I sort of already mentioned is the HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System, which gives you this, just that, a file system for storing data. Again, you can save it in one machine, but the moment you were talking about big data, you need multiple machines for that. So you need the infrastructure to handle uh, storing all that data. And again, this is not just about splitting the data across multiple machines, but also, right, whenever you're talking about multiple participants, one of them will go down. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how many. So you basically have to find, have some sort of strategy. If a machine goes down, what do you do with the data set there? Do you move it across? Do you rebalance it? If you want to add more machines, what do you do there? And, you know, this sounds like an old problem, but it's also a complicated one. So Hadoop HDFS gives you that infrastructure. You don't have to worry about that. You just put Hadoop on it. You say, okay, this machine joins this cluster, and that's it. The whole discovery, the whole rebalancing, everything is taken care of by Hadoop, or at least HDFS. Now, on top of that, you have the MapReduce framework. What that gives you is, well, now you have multiple machines that are storing a lot of data. You have to analyze. You have to do something with the data. So obviously, you can do it sort of outside the cluster. We're just looking in, looking at the data, and analyzing it. But that is going to take a long time because you're talking here about a lot of data. So what you can do is also use a cluster to analyze that data. Right? You have multiple machines, each of them storing one piece of data, and then you can also use each machine to analyze that piece of data. So now you're not, you don't just have multiple storage units, but also multiple computational units. And again, the infrastructure is provided for you by Hadoop. So you just write the code, you distribute it, and the whole dispatch of the code, finding the data, relocating, moving the data to where the code is, or vice versa, is handled by Hadoop. So for the most part, the infrastructure is taken care of you, for you. Uh, on top of that, you tend to have this, um, well, popular, I guess they are the most popular uh, utilities or tools or libraries. Uh, as you'll see, MapReduce tends to be fairly efficient, but it's fairly low level. So that's why to improve productivity, typically, you would use one of these uh, libraries. You have cascading, 
um, pig, hive, and age base. As you all see, it's quite interesting, um, well, naming for each of these projects. And you, you have the guy there at the left, which is sort of a, this is a zookeeper, just an infrastructure service for doing coordination between different nodes. Just the, something uh, that I, well, that I should point out. So, if you look at the detail, okay, what do you have? Well, MapReduce is a fancy name for what is called divide et impera or divide and conquer, which is basically a functional uh, programming approach in saying when I have a big problem, I'm just dividing it into small pieces and I'm addressing each piece one by one. Now, the idea here is you have to do this in parallel, meaning that the, pro the problem itself can be parallelized. Otherwise, if I'm splitting it and still have to do it in a serialized manner, it's not going to give me any benefits. So what you see there is sort of what MemoryDuce is all about. You have some sort of data set. You split into uh, pieces or, you know, depending on how many nodes you want. And then each piece is basically analyzed by what is called a mapper, which looks into the data set and then potentially uh, creates some results of it, which are later on aggregated by what is called the reducer. Now, uh, there are some interesting things going on uh, behind, such as the reducer is going to always get the, um, the results from the mapper in order. But again, as I mentioned, these are fairly low level and, well, it's easy to pick up, but also easy to get efficient with it. So how does it look in practice? Well, the hello world for big data or Hadoop is word count. And the reason is if you have one cluster, a huge cluster to only print hello world is not, you know, a good use of your money and cluster. So typically with counting words, you can say, well, this is a nice problem that can be very well paralyzed such as rather than one entity or one book or one person writing or reading a book, I can divide it by chapters or by pages, and then I can use each node to count the words, right? And then I can aggregate the results. So rather than taking it one person, I don't know, 20 times uh, per chapter, you can do it, you know, one time with 20 person each doing its own uh, counting of each chapter. Now, what you see here is literally the example from the Hadoop documentation. I've, I've been trying to cramp it up there so it makes sense. It doesn't, but that's okay. Um, what you see there, the stuff grayed out is sort of the infrastructure, the boilerplate code. You're using a framework, in this case, Hadoop, so you have to extend certain classes or implement certain interfaces. What's interesting, the actual code is the stuff there um, in black letters. So what happens here, we have the mapper, which literally is going to look at whatever data set is given to it. In this case, we're just assuming it's a text file, is going to read it line by line. Each line is going to be tokenized. So we split the line into words, and then each word is going to be sent to the reducer. Why? Because again, the map reduce paradigm says that the reducer is going to receive the words basically in in order. So you know that rather than scattering data across a cluster, after the mapper is looking at the actual items, the infrastructure is going to sort them out. So each reducer is going to work on different uh, working sets rather than dip on each other. So what we're doing there at the bottom is the reducer is saying, okay, so I'm getting the words, and then for each word I'm going to count it, literally, and then I'm writing the information to the disk. The concept is, I would say, fairly easy to grasp, but at the same time, if you look at this code, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because you're not dealing with a lot of data. You have to do a lot of uh, tiptoeing around the MapReduce framework. So that's why you have this alternative framework to it. One of them is PIG. Um, well, PIG has this, um, um, gives you a scripting language, which is called PIG Latin. And uh, what it does is it uh, gives you sort of manipulation tools for uh, transforming data. So what we do there, again, in gray is loading a file, in this case, as a line. So we're looking at it as uh, being just a bunch of lines. And then for each line, we're going to read them, apply a tokenizing. And then this is where, again, the actual uh, magic occurs. We do the filtering. In this case, we're limiting the spaces. We're doing a group by, and then for each group, we're doing a counting. Now, even though, again, this is the first time you're exposed to Pig or Hadoop, you can already, at least in my case, feel that, you know, here I can understand more about what's going on behind the scenes because this is, again, a data manipulation language. This is about what you do with the data. And typically you know what type of data you're looking at. With the uh, vanilla or raw map produce, you typically have to bridge that to whatever infrastructure you have, whatever uh, map components you use. 
Hive, in this case, for this particular example, is somewhat shorter, but um, not quite. Hive, again, gives you a more, if you want, a SQL-like uh, interface to MapReduce. So what I'm doing here is, again, I'm looking at uh, the information which is available on HDFS, and I'm saying I'm creating this table uh, called lines, uh, has a structure that um, contains only basically a line, which is a string. I'm loading it from this file books into the to the table, and then I'm doing the select word, and then doing a count. But the, the complexity there is hidden in this lateral view, which, long story short, basically for each entry is going to apply this function, which is called split, is going to eliminate the spaces, and then is going to create a virtual table, and that virtual table is going to do a, do a group by, and then do the actual counting. Now, both pig and hive, and as you'll see cascading, give you just a facade. In the end, this gets compiled somehow to still map it with functions because the whole idea here is to still use the cluster and the infrastructure behind it. So all this grammar, all these words, all these actions actually map directly to some sort of um, map reduce uh, components that are uh, called for you. Now cascading is sort of the uh, last example I'm going to show. Um, in this case, you don't have a scripting language or a SQL language, but actually a higher level Java API um, higher than MapReduce. So here you have components or actions. You define what is called a source and an output, and basically as the data goes from the source to the output, you uh, apply some transformations to it. So what I'm doing there in gray, I'm not sure whether you guys in the back can see, is just defining a source. In this game, it's a text line, so I'm looking at something that has uh, lines of text. I'm then defining an output, in this case, a um, sync, uh, which is going to have two what is called fields or tuples, words and count. And then after I'm connecting this to the sync and the source, I'm going to apply what is called a pipeline. So what I'm doing there is, uh, first of all, applying a regular expression. So for each word, I'm going, again, regular expression is going to look at the word, and then for each of the word, I'm going to do a group by, and then for each group by, I'm going to do a count, and then for every count, I'm going to write that down to the disk. This is, uh, to some degree, you know, just sort of recap. Um, Hadoop is, or raw Hadoop, for those that want, I guess, ultimate performance and are very familiar with MapReduce, is a way to go. Um, Pig and Hive tend to be alternatives for people that are exposed to SQL or data manipulation languages because they don't have to write any code. And cascading, cascading tends to have a, a sweet spot with the developers because you have a nice sort of, well, it's a stretch of the word, but it's some sort of DSL to work with it without having to think too much about what's going on behind the scenes. So the whole scheduling and the relationship behind them, uh, meaning of MapReduce jobs, is already done for you by these three, uh, three frameworks or libraries. So, okay, this is still a spring framework, a spring conference, so where do we go from here? Well, since we're talking about Hadoop, uh, it's worth uh, mentioning a new project. We started actually working on it about one year ago. It's called Spring for Apache Hadoop. And as you'll see, it's about simplifying uh, Hadoop applications. Uh, it means integrating with Hadoop, Pig, Hive, Cascading, and also offering um, some additional things on top, not just in terms of uh, configuration, but also of how you would go about expanding beyond um, just Hadoop itself, how you would integrate that inside your application. As you'll see, we have some nice spring batch and spring integration uh, integration there, not just around Hadoop, but also around HDFS itself, meaning um, not even if you want to use Hadoop, but if you want to interact with the data behind Hadoop. It's sort of a quick uh, big picture of how Spring for Apache Hadoop integrates with the rest of the projects. Typically, or in its lower form, you would use Spring with just a Spring Framework, meaning you're just uh, using the configuration side, but Typically, you don't want to use, uh, you want to store the data in some sort of uh, data store, whether there's relational database or not. This is where Spring Data comes in. Um, you want to read data, uh, especially as it comes in for various sources, and this is where you have event-driven application, or if you want to do on and off Hadoop workflows, such as uh, using Spring Batch. Again, I'll talk about that later on. So, <clears throat> Now that you have you know, this Hadoop infrastructure and you potentially have decided some sort of tool, whether it's Hadoop itself or, he or Hive or Peg or Cascading, you know, what does it take? And it's a sort of vanilla usage and how uh, Spring can improve this scenario. So assuming you have your work count, right, the map on the reducer, 
Um, this is again taken from the example. This is typically what you'd have to do is defining a configuration, say, saying, okay, this is my mapper, this is my reducer, this is a data type that I'm looking at, uh, which is called the input and output uh, format, such as what, what's the um, actual representation of the data that I'm reading and then writing. You also have some internal things there, such as how, what is the protocol between the mapper and the reducer, which is the key class and the value class. Right, the input and output path, and then submitting the job. And typically that happens through uh, the command line, which is Hadoop, specify the jar, so you uh, pack everything up, the mapper and the reducer, your configuration, you create the jar, and then you send the jar against the cluster. Which is fine, except that if you already have a, a Java application for it, um, or continuously creating jars and manually submitting them, or potentially going down to the command line is not exactly productive. So this is one area where um, H HDP or basically Spring for Apache Hadoop, uh, Hadoop improves uh, the situation. And that is, uh, first of all, it makes it somewhat easy to configure a job. You can find right there at, uh, in the first um, definition, if you're looking at the inside application context, uh, we have a dedicated namespace for creating a job. Uh, it's, we tend to use sensible defaults. So once you specify the mapper and the reducer in this case, Again, just for uh, vanilla MapReduce, we can automatically infer the key types. Uh, we can automatically infer by using, uh, looking at the generic signature, what type of um, input and output format to use and what's, uh, what type of protocol the mapper and the reducer use. Uh, also, it's, we leverage the uh, Spring property placeholder quite a lot. And this gives you the nice benefit of externalizing things. So for example, if you just want to um, declare a Hadoop cluster, all you have to do is uh, define that HDFS configuration. We automatically look at the class path, load the Hadoop configuration, and whenever you want, we, you can override that by pointing to a different property files. Um, the interesting thing here, uh, not sure how many of you have uh, attended the Jurgen's presentation, you can also um, piggyback on top of the um, environment abstraction. So you can say, well, I have, I'm running the same application with the same configuration, either against my local cluster, my pseudocode configuration cluster, or against Amazon EMR, or against a different cluster. And all you have to do really is just uh, decide or tell Spring what type of environment configuration you have to use. But you don't have to create any jars. You don't have to create to do any, any submission uh, from the command line if you don't want to, right? That's the whole point. It's, it's easy to integrate this inside your application without having to modify your workflow or the way you go around using um, Hadoop. We also have there what is called a job run. This is if, um, if you want to submit the job automatically, but again, if you don't, if you just want to use this programmatically, we support that as well. Um, we spend quite a lot of time making sure that people that are already using Hadoop don't have to necessarily rewrite their application. So if you're already using Hadoop, if you already have jars of jobs that are being used, what we call sort of legacy jars, we support them as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but the nice thing, sort of, you know, one of the nice things that we do there is um, you can change the configuration. As I mentioned before, you can pick another configuration and you don't have to repack your jar. Basically, when we start up your jar, we automatically configure Hadoop and we inject the proper configuration inside your jar so you don't have to, again, rewrite anything. Um, speaking about um, declarative or, or programmatic approach to uh, using the jobs, right, in the previous example, it was, okay, this is how you declare, this is how you, you will run it, but at the end of the day, a job or Hadoop are just, you know, Java and objects, so if you want to inject that and manually submit or control the job or get statistics about it, you can do that as well. This is just basic DI, nothing fancy about it. Now, in case of pig, uh, there is the type you have sort of the uh, vanilla use of pig. Again, you can see it's command line based because, well, pretty much everything except cascading tends to be command line based in Hadoop. So you would write your script and then you will run it from the command line. You also have an interactive shell, but typically once you have the script done, you just submit it to the cluster. Um, one well, downside of PIG or with Hadoop as well is that parameterizing the scripts tend to be tedious because you have to specify them from the command line or you have to potentially specify a properties file. So it's kind of hard to share uh, information between Hadoop, PIG, 
and the various uh, things that you're using. There at the bottom you have sort of an extension of that. Again, you, as you can see, sort of a declarative usage, first of all, of what it would take to submit a um, or configure pig, and that's the thing there at the top pig server. Um, this was just going crazy with the different options that you have, so you can read uh, from a properties file, you can specify properties on the fly, you can specify a location, and you can specify, again, you can parameterize a script if you want to. And what we're doing there at the bottom, we even allow you to specify a nested script, so it doesn't have to reside somewhere, you can just specify it on the fly, you can use spring expression or anything like that to specify the script there, and we basically just create automatically and run it and submit it for you. So you get more flexibility in that regard. And again, you can run it as startup or you can run it on demand. Hive tends to go, um, in, tends to have a similar usage pattern. Um, again, you have some, you need to have some script saved somewhere. You can parameterize it again from the command line and you submit it by, uh, again, uh, th from the shell, from the command line. But also because it has this SQL-like nature, it provides out of the box a JDBC driver for it. Now, this is not really JDBC. It's not full JDBC, but you can use it sort of to interact with it. And again, this is sort of an example uh, taken from their site where, well, it's the same GDBC API that you're used to, uh, which means it's ugly, it hasn't changed, but um, you, know, you can have Hive running behind it. So you can, again, have the create statement, execute query, and things like that. Which means if you're going to use Spring, uh, first of all, we make it very easy to um, connect to Hive again in a declarative manner. We're using the Thrift client. One nice feature uh, that we also added is we allow you to create a Hive server automatically. So for those of you that are doing testing or just doing development, you don't have to install this. You just, again, tell us where you want the Hive server to be, to be started and we do that automatically so you don't have to do any provisioning. We also support, similar as with PIG, this is right about consistency, the option of uh, specifying either on the fly or automatically read a Hive script you can parameterize it if you want. But when it comes to the JDBC or sort of, you know, the programmatic usage, there again you can tap into the rich support of JDBC from Spring Framework. So we're talking here about JDBC template. Now, if you look at this slide, there is nothing really uh, Hadoop uh, or Spring for Apache Hadoop specific. This is just the Spring JDBC template. Uh, the configuration actually is exactly the same. Notice that we're using the data source, simple driver data source from uh, uh, Spring Framework, and we're using the Hive driver. So this is, again, one of these examples where you can reuse the same APIs that you know, you can reuse the same concepts, just that the data store behind it is different. In this case, using Hive, so every query that you make results in various MapReduce jobs that are being run against your cluster. The query side. So uh, another interesting thing that we offer in a Spring for Apache Hadoop is the idea of providing shell operations. Now, since you're working against a cluster, typically you have to do some sort of um, setup of your jobs. This means looking whether you have some files, um, looking at the folder names, potentially rewriting them. And Hadoop has what is called a file system shell or FS shell, where from the command line you can literally do ls or make directory or change permissions against a cluster, which means if you want to do that, typically, again, you have to run from the command line. Now, you do have a file system API, but that needs to be configured. So one thing that we did is open up the, uh, both the file system API, but also the shell, to any scripting language that runs on top of the JVM. So what that means is any JSR223 provider, meaning <clears throat> Groovy, JavaScript, in this case, Rhino, um, Jyphon, uh, JRuby even, anything that runs on top of the JVM can get direct access to Hadoop, the Hadoop file system. So, for example, what we're doing here, these are just two scripts uh, that we're running uh, that are taken from our test suite. This is just inside your Hadoop configuration, a script basically that does some provisioning or does some testing against the Hadoop cluster. So in this case, the script automatically, because this is the uh, Hadoop namespace, automatically is wired to the existing Hadoop configuration inside your cluster, is going to have this variable exposed, meaning FS shell, the file system shell from Hadoop, and the file system API. And what we're doing is we're just using it through a scripting language. So you don't have to write any code, Java code against it. So what we're doing there at the top, we're using Groovy to just create a name, 
a final script, then we're using the, um, the file system API to copy the local file, and then what I've uh, um, highlighted there is that we're using the shell to do a test, check whether the directory there, if not, make the directory copy, change the permissions, and then print something to the screen. Uh, the same script sort of uh, is underneath using, in this case, using JavaScript. Um, there, again, there's nothing sort of special here, You're just using the same old, or at least the existing infrastructure. Uh, what we're doing is we're providing the glue, the connection. So again, you don't have to configure the file system shell, you don't have to connect to the Hadoop cluster, we automatically do this for you. And this is quite handy because typically, again, before running a job, you need to look at the cluster, potentially do some cleanup, prepare some folders, and uh, scripts are an excellent way of doing that. Now, in case of uh, a pipeline, typically Hadoop doesn't exist as an island, right? Okay, you have the Hadoop cluster, you've chosen your API or library that you want to use, you know the data that you want to store. What happens? How do you get data into Hadoop? What do you do with the results? Where do you store them, right? Hadoop is not an island. So typically, you would have to mix technologies. You have to integrate Hadoop into your application, into your architecture. So just as an example, what you typically want to do is have scheduling. So when you're looking at a word count, you know, what does it take to have scheduling added to it? Well, scheduling is, um, I guess you can say, a deal, uh, a done deal in um, Java. There are so many libraries out there, so, so much support for it. So in this case, all we have to do, and right, because Spring leverages most of that, we can just plug in a Spring scheduler, use Quartz scheduler, or even the JDK timer, and use that to trigger our jobs. So this is just an example where you can see the different um, uh, functionality, some that already exists inside Spring Framework, some that is added to Spring for Apache Hadoop. So what we're doing here, we're saying, okay, I'd like to count words every 10 hours. So this means, first of all, I need to define a scheduler. In this case, right, I'm um, calling the MapReduce job. I'm calling actually submit method on it. Um, and then specifying the current expression. As far as Spring is concerned, this is just an endpoint for the trigger. So every 10th hour, this particular method is going to be called. The fact that it's submitting a um, method to the map reduce or Hadoop cluster is just um, you know, something separate from the whole scheduling process itself. Um, what you see there is, uh, in the map reduce job highlighted, is the use of Spring expression language. Uh, in order to generate a different uh, output path for the job. Because we're running the same job, the same definition over and over again, right? The definition itself becomes some sort of template. Meaning, okay, I'm, I'm looking at some sort of input path, but then I have to write the data somewhere else. Now, if I would have the same output folder, it means that every time I'm running the job, I'm going to rewrite right, the output path. And in terms of big data, that's a big no-go. And the reason for that is it takes a long time to analyze the data. In some cases, it takes hours or days. So you don't want to override that. Typically, you want to add the results there because seeing when you're talking about big data, it's not necessarily about storage, the fact that you don't have it, but rather you have too much storage, too much data, and you want to save time. So it's about time mainly. So what we're doing here, and again, this is nothing you know, revolutionary. This is nothing fancy. It's just the same functionality that's already available in Spring 3, in this case Spring Expression Language, to say, well, every time that scheduler is going to call submit method on my MapReduce job, the MapReduce job, because it's a prototype, is going to be re-evaluated. And in this case, the output path, because I'm using Spring Expression Language, is going to call that method path utils format, which simply adds the date to the path. You know, something, again, very simple, but you can see how I can use different components together to get the job done. So I don't have to write any code. I don't have to reinvent anything. I'm just reusing the tools that I have at my disposal. Now, another example um, is using MongoDB, for example. Uh, in the keynote, Mark used Redis. Uh, so I said, okay, I'm just going to showcase uh, MongoDB. Right, using word count, but if you want to go towards the opposite way of saying, I want to use things on demand, let's say um, I want to parameterize a job, what you can do is typically um, save the results or potentially increment some counters inside a different store, in this case MongoDB. So what we're doing here is just showcasing sort of the um, 
uh, other support in spring, inside Spring Data Project. We have again our job definition, the MapReduce job is pretty much the same. We also have the Mongo template, which is connecting to it through well, Mongo, MongoDB template. And then inside our worst service, um, if you look at it, there, again, there is not much happening. Right, because the sort of the complexity is hidden away from you. you can, you're just injecting a job, the Mongo template, and what we're doing there is every time we call process words, we're doing what is called an upsert, basically meaning if the data is not there, you're doing an insert. If the data is there, you're doing an update for Mongo using Mongo DB template. Right, so every time I'm calling this job, I'm saying this user has already called the job, so I'm incrementing it. Right, and potentially I can add some conditions saying, well, you've already uh, submitted too many jobs. You've um, you're out of coda, and then submitting the job as well. So whether you want to go full way the declarative approach, whether you want to use the programmatic one, or you want to mix and match, that's entirely up to you. Uh, Spring for Apache Hadoop doesn't make any prescription in that regard. Uh, speaking sort of the, you know, looking at the big picture here, one thing that you'll notice is typically, um, Whenever you're talking about data or data sources, you have what is called right, an enterprise or event-based application. Uh, this is, again, you know, separate from Hadoop. If you're looking at um, where data comes from, you end up with what is called right, enterprise application integration. And the core, um, I guess, the fundamental topic there is that everything is about a message, which is a somewhat simple concept, but it gives you some nice benefits. And the main one is that you have the decoupling between the source and the destination, sort of between the producer and the consumer. You end up with what is called right, a pipes and filter-based architecture, which, if you still recall the, the whole big holistic view of big data pipeline, it was about you know, messages or the data flowing through the different components that you have. So to some degree, you have this idea right, of an endpoint communicating with a different endpoint. You have a message that is being sent. And the message can stand for everything or anything that you can think of. It can be data. It can be an instruction. It can be a directive. It's just an abstract format of transforming data. A good example there that most people use, uh, right, you can think of this as sort of uh, a messages-driven architecture, event-driven architecture is what most of you are probably already using in Linux or Macs, which is just finding some words inside a file. Right? There is the bottom I'm saying, I'm doing a cat on um, a file, then I'm grabbing the word the, and what, for each line that I get, I'm going to do an echo. So this is fairly basic, right? I'm using pipes. But the interesting thing there is that none of this instruction or commands such as cat or grab or while or echo is aware of each other. So they each work you know, separate from each other, each work in isolation, and yet I can assemble, assemble them in a certain shape or form to end up with what I want. In this case, just doing the search for, the, for, for the, each line that starts with the or contains the inside that file. So yes, you can say this is um, a pipes or filter-based architecture. Right? You have the endpoint in this case can become a producer, uh, the other one can become a consumer, but the interesting thing here is because they are decoupled, uh, because I have this thing called message in between, I can change each of these parties, I can even modify them, and my architecture for the most part doesn't change because, again, I'm having decoupling. So I can change one side without having to redo the whole thing. Right, so in this case, the producer can become a file, uh, the consumer uh, cannot even be an endpoint per se, but rather a route, which means rather than being the end result of that file, is just a dispatcher forward uh, to some other environment. I can change the file to JMS. The route can potentially be TCP, right? I can play around with all these ends, and still, for the most part, the left-hand or right-hand side remains the same because these two things are decoupled. So why is this important? Well, because as I said at the beginning, uh, we view big data pipelines or big data architectures and as being literally an integration problem or an integration architecture. And the nice thing there is if you approach it as such, you end up with different decoupled entities that are working together but can be modified because typically you end up continuously reworking your pipeline without having to redo the whole architecture, without having to redo the whole infrastructure. And so uh, our answer, sort of the, um, the spring solution for integration is a spring integration project, uh, appropriately named. 
is based on the enterprise integration patterns, uh, that book by Gregor Hofby. Hopefully I didn't butcher the name too much. It's been around for quite a while, 2007. I presume most of you are already familiar with it. And while well, the core concepts on Spring integration are really having a POJA-based messaging um, architecture. And why is that important? Because it means you just have, you're just thinking in terms of object, which is a first-class citizen inside Java, and you can map that on top of messaging. So really, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. In terms of components, well, there are plenty. Uh, you have this concept of a channel, meaning a rerouting or sort of connecting to entities. You have different operations that you can apply as the messages go in, such as um, routing, transformer, or you mentioned those, splitter, aggregator. And you have plenty, plenty of adapters. And these are interesting because, again, when you're looking at big data, typically you have various sources that produce data, and again, various sinks or um, storages for those data. In some cases, it's even a circle. You push data out, do something with it, and then you push it back. So you would have to integrate somehow. You have to adapt to these uh, various sources. And Spring integration here is a nice fit because it already provides those adapters. In particular, something that it, it, it's interesting um, for this use case that I'm going to present, which is tail, syslogd, and hdfs. Meaning tail, you can already sort of look at a source, and every time something happens right, you see the output there, and you can do something with it. Syslogd, if you're pushing logs somewhere, um, this is right, a, the system logger daemon, and hdfs, which is a file system for uh, Hadoop, or the distributed file system. So let's take a look at an example, for example, such as pooling log file. Right? This is a typical use case for big data, meaning I have various uh, servers around, um, web servers, let's say, and every time I'm producing data, typically log files, I want those logs to be analyzed. I want to know who's visiting my website, how many times, right? what's your IP, what's your browser, things like that. The interesting thing here, you end up with two conditions. Because you don't have this flat line, you tend to have spikes, right? You can, you can say, well, every time I have a log, which is, I don't know, 4 or 10 megs, I want to save it. Or in case the logs do not grow up, because I don't want the spike to come in and completely fill up my disk, I can say I'm waiting for 10 minutes or 2 hours, and if I still don't have 10 megabytes of logs, I'm just sending that out and storing it so I can then later on analyzing it. So if you break this down, this example ends up with, well, you have to pull a directory for files or resources, right? After you see some file being rolled over, in this case, let's say 10 minutes, you want to do some sort of copying to some staging area. This is optional because, well, you can say, I can either, if I have multiple sources, I can either aggregate the files or potentially I can remove any sensitive information or I can just zip them so uh, I'm saving s some space. Then I'm copying the files to HDFS, and then, well, I'm doing the actual analysis of it. Once the, the data is in there, I'm triggering the cluster, I'm triggering the job to do the analysis. So again, I, I can potentially save the file to HDFS and then look for it from outside, but the whole idea of Hadoop and MapReduce is you use a cluster not just to save data, but you use a cluster as well to analyze data, because again, in a real-world scenario, you'd have a lot of incoming data that you couldn't process or store with just one machine. So this would look something like this. Uh, this is, these are just the uh, four steps being broken down in, um, let's say, building blocks provided by Spring Integration. So you would have a file in adapter. This literally says, I'm looking at a, from files. I can look at a folder or some sort of location. Each time, this, I am finding enough files based on the condition or the configuration. I'm going to send that file for this channel, right? This is just an idea of a virtual sort of transporter to the gateway. And the gateway literally is going to contain that uh, information saying, well, do you have enough files? Because potentially um, I still have to wait another extra five minutes for the rest of the host to send me their log files. Or does this file take up more than 10 megabytes before sending it out? And then I'm literally sending it through another channel. In this case, uh, the channel is going to lead to HDFS. So I'm doing a copy there. And once the file is copied, I can actually do the transformation in case I want to, or fire up directly the aggregator to say, I have enough files being stored in HDFS. I have 10 files, or 10 minutes have passed in the last job, so I can now submit it. Um, I'm not really a... Uh, 
a big drawing person. So uh, for the most part, actually, this configuration right here, as you'll see, was taken from the, um, not necessarily this bit here, which is the inbound channel adapter, but from the Springs, Springs for Soul Suite. Um, what you see here is literally the um, example that Mark used behind the scenes to create this uh, keynote demo, and this is sort of how it looks like being visualized. This is just a configuration um, that you can look at and see the different components there being aggregated. What you see here is really just what it takes to do the configuration. This is the XML approach. You can also use a Scala DSL if you want to. Um, and it just showed the file input adapter, in this case what I've mentioned, for doing a pooling of a file. The rest already happens, as you'll see, with the Spring for Apache Hadoop. Now, another interesting example that you tend to have, um, not necessarily with pooling, which you can consider sort of a uh, batch approach in that you do things at a certain rate, no matter how many events occur, is to have streaming. Streaming means it's sort of like real time. Right? You can wait for two hours and nothing happens, or suddenly you have this incoming flow of data in. So this is it's the opposite side of the spectrum. So in this case, for this example, we can say we're doing a tail, meaning you look at a file, and every time something writes in that file, we're going to you know, get the data and then push it out. So by doing it similar, we're doing the transformation, potentially based on the information there, let's assume we're uh, telling something regarding credit cards, so we can remove the sensitive information and if you're looking at some sort of, um, I don't know, platinum card uh, users, we can send them to a different uh, processing area than the rest of the users. So what we do here is writing again data into HDFS for analysis and potentially doing some filtering on the fly and storing data in Redis. Again, you, tend, you end up with this idea of a pipeline where you can use the same building blocks, adjust them a bit, so you, we still have this adapter, in this case it's going to be a tail file adapter. We're sending that, we can potentially apply some transformation, such as again, removing the sensitive information out of it. And then based on the content, we can do routing. So in this case, the endpoint is not really going to be the end of it, but rather a rerouter. We can either save all the information to HDFS, or potentially we can do some filtering as we do in Redis, and then send it out, um, in this case, Redis adapter, which is really just the Redis uh, key value store. Another interesting example, and you can already sort of see the same uh, pipeline being developed further and further, is having a multi-node file example. The idea here being you're not just having one source or one destination, but rather you have multiple nodes, uh, such as multiple um, web servers that are sending the logs in and potentially having multiple machines where you're sending this information, let's say multiple clusters even. So uh, the data aggregation um, happens across multiple machines. Now, the interesting thing here is that um, we're just talking about endpoints. So the fact that you're receiving the information only from one endpoint or multiple really doesn't make any difference as long as spring integration or your pipeline is concerned. So you can have different or the same tail adapter on multiple machines, watching on multiple machines, running locally, and then sending that to the same source or the same router. In this case, a TCP outbound can send to the same TCP inbound or to a, a load balancing router that can dispatch the information on different nodes. And then from there on, it's right the same uh, pipeline where you're just uh, sending it to some other action. You can do some transformation and then potentially, again, rerouting it again. Uh, that was that's sort of a you know a quick glimpse of what it takes to do event-based workflows or event-based applications. But it's also interesting to look at batch workflows. Um, the idea behind batch workflows is the events that you save or potentially the data that you save needs to be looked at as whole. So you cannot just look at the window, but rather the whole information available inside your Spring Hadoop or sorry Hadoop cluster, which means. It takes a long time for it to process. That's why it's called batching, because you're looking at a lot of data. So one answer or one uh, solution that we have in the batch space, independent of Spring or uh, sorry, Spring Hadoop or Hadoop itself is Spring Batch, that gives you a framework for doing batch operations. Now, batch itself isn't sexy. It's about uh, the typical do while, where you do the same operation over and over again, right? Like reading a file, and then you copy it across the wire. The problem is many times you have to do an if-else in there, such as, okay, 
I'm reading a file, right? It's a batch operation, which means it takes a long time to complete because let's say I'm going through a gazillion billion gigabytes. Now, if one of those files contains an um, incorrect entry, or as if I'm sending data across the network goes down, what do I do then? Do I repeat the whole thing? Potentially, but then I'm wasting all the work that I've done previously. Do I ignore it? Maybe if it's a first error, right, I can just mark it as invalid and move on. Uh, what happens if I have five errors, right? You end up with all these different, I mean, conceptually, it's just do while something multiple times, but what happens is something goes wrong, right? The longer it takes, the higher the chances are something will go wrong. So with Spring Batch, you have the building blocks. So you can say, do this, and then figure out some strategy. Retry if the connection goes down. Ignore the exception, or this type of exception is critical. I cannot ignore it. I cannot go on, so bail out. Potentially, save the information, and later on, if I'm retrying the batch job, I'm not going to start from the beginning, but actually start from where I left. Off. So um, again, building blocks for having declarative and reusable uh, tasks that you can just use. And one thing that you see there on the slide is we also have, again, nice support for uh, inside tooling, inside SDS, which is quite handy because typically batch jobs tend to grow uh, just like uh, uh, integration pipelines. So one interesting thing um, that you have that you can do with Hadoop is on Hadoop workflows. So by on Hadoop, I mean you're executing the actual um, work inside the cluster. So the data is inside the cluster, your work uh, also happens inside the cluster. So one thing interesting that, that you can do with Spring Batch is use it as a coordinator for executing different jobs inside your Hadoop cluster, right? Because Hive, Hadoop, Pig, Cascading define one job, but typically you want to change those jobs to get something out of it, such as count the words, or look at all the books, see the books with the most words, and then potentially publish the results. Each one is a different task. So it has to be either executed in order, potentially move data from one to another. Right, so for example, what we're doing here is we're doing an HDFS operation, such as we're moving some data in uh, HDFS. It's big data, so potentially it can take a long time. After we're done, we're going to do a, execute a pig script on top of that, such as um, finding, um, I don't know, uh, the most recent books. Once we've done that, we can execute in parallel a MapReduce job to say, well, find me the most popular authors, and then with Hive or Cascading, I can say, again, count the words. And once I have that, I can save the results and potentially publish that, right? That's the typical workflow. You have multiple operations that tend to be chained. Now, you don't have to go, as I'm uh, exemplifying here, you know, crazy and use all these different frameworks. But the idea is you need to change them. You need to coordinate them somehow. Potentially, you can even, as we do here, you can fire them in parallel and wait until all of these tasks are executed, have executed, and then proceed to the next stop. So what we're doing here is we're using Spring Batch. This is the actual example uh, that we have again in our test suite, and this is how it looks like um, inside STS. What you see there on the uh, on your right hand side is literally the job definition. So in Spring Batch, you define a job where you describe what you want Spring Batch to do. So what we do there is the first step is literally doing the import. So we're saying, I'm going to copy data to HDFS. Again, we're talking here about a lot of data, so this can take anywhere from, I don't know, 30 seconds to five days, depending on how much data and how good your connection is. One of that step is done, and we're moving to the second one, which is doing the work count, in this case using PEG. After we're done with PEG, we're going to um, move to a parallel step, and there we're going to run in parallel a MapReduce job, which is going to, um, I don't know, find the author, and then the other one, which is going to um, find the most popular book. And once we're done, we're going to do an additional step, such as looking at the information that was saved by both Hive and Pig inside HDFS and put it out. So this is literally the workflow that we're trying to describe. And this is, again, pure Spring Batch. And if you look at it, there is nothing Hadoop-specific. There is nothing Spring for Hadoop-specific. It's just, just raw Spring Batch. This is something that you can use right now with you know, version 1.2 or 2.1.9. There is nothing. There is no awareness of Hadoop there. So what we do here is just show the tasklets, which are the, sort of the steps or the wrappers that happen 
the wrappers around the application that are used inside each step. But in this case, the actual wrapper is around HDFS and Hadoop itself using Spring Hadoop. So what we're doing is we're using Spring Bash to define a workflow and then using Spring for Hadoop to say, well, each step interacts or provides a interaction or a job against Hadoop itself. So the first one is the import tasklet is backed up by a Groovy script. We, in this case, we can use a file system shell or the file system API from Hadoop to do the cleanup or potentially doing the import. The second one is literally going to just call this work on job, uh, which is just the Hadoop example for doing work counts. Um, then we can do the pick tasklet to find, well, the handsomest uh, author or the handsomest book. And then potentially, again, we can use a Hive script as well in parallel with a pick script to look for authors. Right? So we're talking about different frameworks or different scripts that are assembled. And obviously, you can mix and match. You can uh, use Spring Batch, in this case, to work against Hadoop or potentially just do that outside, such as importing a CSF C comma separated value file inside a, um, a database. Anything goes as far as Spring Batch and a Spring for Apache Hadoop are concerned. Um, this is, well, I guess I still have plenty of time for questions. So this is just a page with the resources out there. We have um, just announced RC1 for Spring for Apache Hadoop, uh, especially for uh, Spring 1. Uh, this is our web page. Uh, you can obviously find the code. It's Apache license. It's open source at uh, GitHub. Uh, we also have some nice blog entries, um, such as uh, samples and the discussions with, behind architecture. But also there at the bottom, there is an upcoming book uh, that actually most of you guys can get it for free here from O'Reilly that talks about Spring Data has one dedicated chapter on Spring for Apache Hadoop using the latest RC1. So if you're interested more, uh, check out that book on Spring Data and also the various books on Spring Integration, Spring itself, Spring Batch. And um, that's about it. So if there are any questions, yes. So the question was, what was the HDFS? How does HDFS work with caching? Okay. Okay. Okay, so if I understand your question correctly, how does Hadoop help me with distributed system that already caches the data? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so in order for Hadoop to be effective, Hadoop has to own the data. This is pretty much the philosophy behind any system uh, that does analytics or does searching. Right? So the concept behind Hadoop is you have the cluster. Hadoop manages a cluster. So once you put data in, uh, the HDFS file system not only distributes your data, but actually is aware of where the data is. So this feeds back into when you s submit a job, whether you do it through Hive directly, pay cascading, Hadoop itself knows where the data is, is going to move the code to the data or potentially the data to the code. So you have data locality. To some degree, again, they're working on improving that and then executing the code in parallel and getting the code out. Again, if you're looking at a small uh, piece of data that doesn't, it looks like it's over-engineered, but when you're talking about petabytes of data, knowing exactly where your data is and potentially moving that because you don't have, if you have a 500 node cluster, it doesn't mean that the entire cluster has to work on the same task. Potentially these nodes work on one task, the rest of the nodes work on something else. So it's important for Hadoop itself as an infrastructure to know where the data is, how many times it can split the data, and what are the nodes available, not in terms of storage, but also computational power, because you can save the, the data across five nodes, and you can use either three nodes or 10 nodes to look at that data. Typically, you want, at most, uh, the same uh, number of nodes as the nodes that are saving the data, because otherwise you are uh, providing a bottleneck. Yes.
So if you already have the data that you're looking at in a different system, you would, if you want to use Hadoop meaningfully, you would have to write the data inside Hadoop. Because if the data is all outside, Hadoop internally needs to say, okay, where is the data? Is it outside? Then I have to copy that data. So if you just copy it over the wire, let's say, Hadoop doesn't know where it is. It has to store it on its file system. A lot of things inside Hadoop are not in memory. They are saved because the working side or the working set is so big it doesn't fit in memory. So there are all these steps that in case the node goes down, right, because you're doing analysis, there are so many nodes, you don't want the information to be lost. And that's why um, every now and then, actually quite often, Hadoop is going to write everything to the file system as a key. So the mapper itself knows, okay, these are the keys I'm done sending it to the reducer. So there are a lot of, you know, intricacies behind the scenes. And you cannot just say, I'm using the Hadoop uh, MapReduce without the Hadoop storage. It's vice versa. Potentially, you can use HDFS without the MapReduce, but not the other way around. Okay. Yes? Um, Hadoop already has some chaining mechanism for MapReduce jobs. How does it compare with the chaining that, that you showed us with uh, Spring Batch? Okay, so um, I guess the question was already clear, but I'm just going to repeat it anyway. Uh, how does uh, spring batch or how does the chaining that I just showed compare to the MapReduce chaining or Hadoop chaining. So the chaining inside MapReduce is per job, meaning you can have a MapReduce reducer or mapper, mapper, reducer, reducer, right? Uh, what we're doing here is something that goes beyond Hadoop. So spring batch is completely unaware of Hadoop. Whether in this case you want to chain Hadoop itself or you want to use Hadoop and something on top of Hadoop or you want to use, let's say, I'm, writing, I'm reading information from, let's say, the uh, system that, the, you know, your colleague said. I want to write that to HDFS, and then I want to start Hadoop, and then I want to uh, do another dump, and then I want to use, again, Hadoop, right? You cannot use Hadoop because every tool inside Hadoop is Hadoop-specific. Spring Batch is agnostic to whatever you're using, so Hadoop is just one job. So if you're just using Hadoop, and or raw, vanilla, Hadoop, you can say, okay, I'm happy with the chaining, potentially, even though I would say Spring Batch is more powerful because it can be parallelized, and that's fine. But typically, you want to go further. You want to say, I, need, I have multiple actors running beyond or uh, besides Hadoop. So it's not just a cluster. The cluster is part of a, a system, so I'm pushing data in, I'm pushing data out. So then your workflow contains more steps than Hadoop. So this is where you know, spring batch or another system that goes beyond the chaining in Hadoop makes sense. Yes? Um, so is, are each of the steps in your pipeline um, completely atomic or is there some mechanism for handling errors within, failures within each step? So like, say, if you have an attribute job and a single partition fails to process, can you, like, trigger a pipeline to uh, repopulate the data Right, so that's, so the question was, and you have to help me here, uh, does... Okay. Right, so whether each step in case of Spring Batch is atomic and can restart or whether, you know, you have to depend on some other mechanism. Um, so there are two aspects here. First of all, uh, you have the um, simple or self-contained MapReduce or Hadoop infrastructure that doesn't provide any, or let's, let's just say that it has some sort but no advanced built-in mechanism in that you can have these SQL files or as you, know, um, as you have these jobs when they're writing into the map or reducer where, where they're using sequence files, you can say, well, I'm depending on some set of strategies, I'm, I'm running the jobs, and then in case something goes wrong, I can try and look at that, try to figure out whether my job has stopped or not. But that's something, right, which is application-specific. What we're doing in Spring Batch, and this is something that we just started playing with, so there's going to be more news on that front, is for each step, we're trying to uh, record where we are for, during the execution. So we're trying to get more insight into what's going on, whether it's Hadoop or Cascading. Now, for Hadoop or Pig or Hive, um, the latter, basically Hive, Cascading, and Pig, are more of a black box in that you configure them, they do the MapReduce jobs, and you know you don't have control over that. Some of them potentially might open up their API, but 
that's uh, something different. So what we tend to do is just focus on the MapReduce side. However, and this is just something that we found out, most people don't use vanilla MapReduce, so this functionality isn't really useful. Um, so I, I guess the answer is yes, we have some ideas, but we don't see enough demand on it, and frankly, uh, this is something that Hadoop itself could leverage a lot better than we could because it's about coordinating about the, as you said, about the partition, about the nodes, and this is something that I think Yarn is trying to address. Uh, for the most part, I'm not sure whether I convey this in my presentation, Spring Hadoop doesn't interfere with your cluster. So as you saw, everything, including Spring Batch and Spring itself, is about configuring, submitting the job, and then sending in your job. Your job doesn't depend on us. So you're not going to have Spring Data Hadoop or Spring itself being distributed inside the cluster because you wouldn't use it. Your job itself or the Hadoop infrastructure doesn't depend on us. Right? We're just doing the directive, the declarative, the configuration. Even with Spring Batch, what we're doing is we're checking in the cluster. It's done okay. We're sending another job. So we're sitting sort of outside. We're a control panel. Uh, in order to provide this functionality that you mentioned about partitioning and controlling, it means you need to be there in the cluster so when something happens, you can get... Right, the information right away, and you can do repartitioning. Now, you can do that remotely, but you don't get the same uh, amount of functionality or you don't, don't get the same features as you would if you'd be inside the cluster. So, um, I, I saw you guys get outreach a long time ago. Yes, and yes. Kojo, Mac right. So, yeah, so the question is, and I guess just to um, open it to the public, was um, we initially when we announced Spring for Apache Hadoop, one of the features that we have, and it, we still do, but it's in a separate branch, is the idea of uh, using POJO-based uh, or annotated-based MapReduce so rather than having that um, word count example where you would extend the class or have int writable and all that right for Hadoop, vanilla Hadoop, you would just have this is a method annotated with mapper, another method annotated with reducer, and that's it. And we will infer the whole thing around it. Uh, that works, it's still there, it's uh, on, a, on a branch, but we haven't merged it back yet because there are two things. This changes um, Spring Hadoop from something that sits and works outside the cluster to something that works inside the cluster. So it's something that some people like, enough people don't like because they already have a big stack and they just want to use that. They consider that, well, this is another runtime component I have to diagnose, I have to send across a cluster. So uh, they have some worries there. And the second and foremost, not that many people are using raw MapReduce. So even though you have the annotated model, it you know, doesn't really lead anywhere. Now, there were some discussions. Um, I don't want to spend too much time because it never actually ended anywhere with various people inside the Hadoop community that were interested in that. And I, we think that is going to be better if they can already provide, because this is just about simplifying the API, so you don't have to pull in the whole uh, you know, Spring for Apache Hadoop just for those annotations, but it depends. It depends whether there's going to be demand for it. That's why we just left it on a branch out there. So um, I guess the answer is maybe, depending if a lot of people are asking for it, frankly. Anybody else? Yes, hi. Um, that's a good question. I think the slides are going to appear on the site, uh, on the website. I, I believe that's going to be the case for all the slides, but uh, the gentleman there is recording me, so I'm pretty sure one way or the other my slides are going to show up somewhere. I, but I don't know exactly to tell you where. Uh, based on the previous years, it's going to appear on the, on the Spring 1 2GX uh, website. Anybody else? Okay, I guess there are no more questions. So, uh, thanks everyone for attending. That's my Twitter ID. Um, hope you enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.